Bienvenue tout le monde. Bonjour, merci d'être parmi nous. Uh, my name is Julie Caffley. I'm Executive Vice President at the Public Policy Forum and delighted to have you with us today um, to the launch of our Skills for the Post-Pandemic World Project. Today, we're going to be kicking off the release of eight papers looking at the future of skills, training, and retraining in ways that will chart a path forward as the pandemic continues to unfold. Um, our panel today will be discussing the implications of the digital transformation taking place across the economy, changing not only which skills we need to thrive at work, but also how we'll learn them and how organizations are adapting. So today our panelists will ask, how do we skill for inclusive innovation? It's going to be a great discussion and we're pleased that so many of you could join us. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off with a virtual land acknowledgement. Typically when we host our events at PPF, uh, we're in Ottawa and we host them on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Um, however, wherever you are today, uh, please take a moment and acknowledge the lands um, where you are today. Um, we extend our respect to all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples for their valuable past, present and future contributions to this land that we call Canada. Um, a big thank you to our partners who have enabled all of this to happen. Skills for the Post-Pandemic World is a collaboration between the Public Policy Forum and the Diversity Institute, funded by the uh, Future Skills Center with support from Microsoft. We're excited to work with these great partners on such an important project. Um, together with our partners, we undertook this project at the beginning of the pandemic, knowing that this research would be invaluable to policymakers, business leaders, learning and training institutions, and others interested in building a robust policy ecosystem that supports the mobility needed for workers and employers to navigate the new reality. We released a scoping report in December, which outlined eight areas for future research. And now we're getting ready to release a research paper on each of those eight topics. Today, we'll be talking about some of the important themes that have come out of that research. The first paper, Digital Infrastructure for the Post-Pandemic World is by Catherine Middleton, and it's available online today. And we can share a copy of that link in the chat for you as well. It provides an in-depth discussion of the importance of broadband access and the ways the digital infrastructure is changing working and learning, um, plus who's being left out. So be sure to, uh, to read that. Um, the next report called New Working Arrangements will explore the implications of working from home. And one of the authors is here with us today to discuss their findings on that report. The report will be available in just a couple of days and you'll all be receiving a copy uh, via email. As soon as it's ready, we'll send it directly to you. And of course, we have another six reports coming after that. They'll be launch launching over the coming weeks. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you, engaging with you on uh, many of them. And of course, we'll have many events to support uh, that work. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. I think we're all getting pretty good at this Zoom stuff. So I don't know how much needs to be done. The event today is in English. Uh, you can ask questions in French as you always can. And uh, most of the responses will be in English, but you can ask questions in both languages. Um, the event will be 90 minutes long and there will be time at the end for questions from the audience. So please feel free to you know, add your questions to chat or will, you might have an opportunity to, um, to ask them yourself as well. Um, the event is being recorded and will be posted online after the event, so uh, be aware of that. L'événement va se dérouler en anglais, mais nous invitons à poser des questions dans la langue de votre choix. Um, je pourrai les traduire pour les panélistes si nécessaire. Um, et vous allez aussi voir qu'il y a des sous-titres qui sont disponibles en français. Le lien pour les sous-titres est disponible dans le chat. Je pense que Heba l'a envoyé à tout le monde. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce um, our first speaker and our event moderator, who's Dr. Wendy Sukir. Wendy is fabulous and fearless, and she's also the founder and academic director at Ryerson University's Diversity Institute. Um, she's also a professor of entrepreneurship and strategy. Um, in addition to providing strategic insight and direction across this project, she's also lent her voice and co-authored the upcoming papers on inclusive workforces, as well as on the skills needed for innovation. She's one of Canada's leading experts in disruptive technologies and, um, and innovation processes and diversity. And we're delighted to have her with us to set the stage with a short presentation and to moderate the panel. So thank you so much for all your support and for being here today, Wendy, over to you. 
Thanks so much, Julie. And thanks to our sponsors. Thanks to our authors. It's a little bit of a daunting task, given the amount of work and brain power that went behind the, the series. So I'm going to pick some of the highlights that, frankly, align with uh, issues that I think are interesting and important. But the panel will expand on some of these. I will now try the famous sharing of my screen. Um, and can everyone see that? Fabulous. I'll try to be um, fairly brief and just tease out some of the, the highlights of the, of the series, looking specifically at um, the, the idea of disruption, but also innovate, innovation, which COVID has in part wrought through the acceleration of technology adoption. I will provide a perspective, only one perspective, on what this means in terms of skills gaps and opportunities and the way forward. And, you know, prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about the disruption technology was going to wreak. And we had, we had many, many um, projections on the number of, of jobs that would disappear, or be augmented or changed and so on and so on. And I have always been a proponent of the hype cycle, suggesting that you know, often technology is overhyped and under-delivered and it takes a while for um, technologies to actually um, be adopted or diffused. And we see some that have been around for 30 years, telehealth, uh, teleeducation and so on. And uh, COVID, <laughs> made a liar of me because things that we were projecting to happen over years, I would say decades, uh, were accelerated very, very quickly. And one of the things that remains really important to remember is that innovation, while we often associate it with the creation of new technologies, innovation is about doing things differently. And that's really what COVID did. Shopify became the biggest company in Canada, not because of new IP or, or um, new discoveries or new technologies or, or whatever. It, it became the largest company in Canada because of the acceleration of the adoption of online shopping, for example, and, and new platforms. And so one of the recurrent themes in, in our our look at what technology disruption really means is to keep in mind that it's not about making new technologies, it's about using them to do things differently, to create new models and so on. And we saw this, um, it, we found amazing examples. Part of the background research for the series simply documented hundreds of cases where companies had pivoted, changed, and in some cases grown. And I think that um, I wouldn't want in any way to minimize the destructive, terrible, terrible impacts of COVID. But in some ways, we have seen innovations, growth, and change um, that for me are, are a silver lining. I don't want to go into this in detail other than to continue to insist that having a sectoral perspective on what's happened is really key because we know that some sectors have been decimated. And unfortunately, those are the sectors where we see the most women-led businesses, indigenous-led businesses, black-led businesses, and so on. But other sectors have grown. And, and in fact, you know, uh, we've seen amazing examples of innovation and transformation in just about every single sector. And I have my I, I do think that um, people didn't overstate it when they called uh, called this our Dunkirk moment in terms of um, you know everybody pulling together and the transformation we've seen in government is amazing. Whether it will stick remains a question, but the ways in which structures and processes and people pivoted and, and simply got the, do the job done was really quite remarkable. We saw lots of SMEs that, that um, shifted their business models and, and basically exploded. <clears throat> Women's College Hospital, full disclosure on the board, but probably um, uh, implemented technology that we were 
expecting to be um, rolled out over about five years in a matter of months. And there are many, many examples of that. We know that the share of customer interactions um, conducted digitally exploded. We know that changes to business operations were very significant and that the smaller the business, the harder they were hit in terms of job loss and, um, and uh, negative impacts. We also know that teleworking um, increased dramatically. And what's interesting is a lot of people don't want necessarily to go back to the old way of working. And certainly Murtaza will have a lot more to say, um, say about this. We, we also know that CEOs of large corporations are starting to reconsider um, work arrangements and lots are giving up their leases or selling their, their physical assets in order to go to new models. That is transformational, not just in terms of the skills that we need to, work, to manage in this new environment, but also the ripple effects. And we also know that, that these, um, these changes are uneven in terms of the access that different segments of the population have, and conversely, the negative impacts that uh, these changes have had. So we know, for example, that um, the transitions that we have seen for women particularly and for newcomers are far greater um, than those that we have seen for the general population. On the other hand, uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis people have been less able to pivot to digital environments in part because of access to, um, access to infrastructure. We've also seen a real shift in the perceptions of technology and automation. So, you know, um, what's that, 35 years ago, but most people saw automation as a negative, as a negative, as something that was going to benefit large corporations and nobody else. Those attitudes are starting, are starting to shift. Um, again, I want to just uh, emphasize that these impacts are um, unevenly felt. So where we had inequality prior to the pandemic, many of the, the reports will, will touch on this. Those, those divides have become chasms and the impact especially on Indigenous people has been particularly um, difficult, again, because of these, um, these issues like access to infrastructure and digital technology, not something Catherine Middleton's paper uh, will address. I wanted to really hone in now on some of the implications in terms of skills, because I think this is really interesting. If we compare what the World Economic Forum said a couple of years ago and what it's saying now in terms of the top rated skills um, that employers are looking for, many of them they're the same. So if you look at the top rated ones, analytical thinking and innovation, active um, complex problem solving, critical thinking and so on, all the same. Active learning and learning strategies the ability to adapt, the ability to pivot, the ability to change. That's moved way up on the list. Technology use, technology design um, weren't on the list before. Now they are among the, the top skills and resilience, stress tolerance and flexibility, all much more in demand. We know that, um, and I don't wanna go, I've, people have heard me say this before, but I think it's really important to recognize that sometimes what we say we need in terms of skills, not necessarily the skills that we need. And you know, I have often said, often employers are looking for skills in all the wrong places because they may overlook talent pools. And I'm old enough to remember the history when everyone said digital skills, digital skills, digital skills, we doubled the number of engineers and we ended up with unemployed engineers. So we have to be really careful to really be clear about what skills we're talking about, how we're defining those skills. And this is yet another example. You know, if you ask students about their skills, they think they're excellent communicators. You ask employers, not so much. And that has to do 
with the way in which the skills are defined. A student thinks writing an essay means they can communicate. For an employer, they're looking for someone who can write short memos and emails and so on. And the other thing, apologies to the engineers in the room, science, technology, engineering, and math, necessary, but insufficient. And when we focus on STEM and when we focus only on technological innovation and when we focus only on tech entrepreneurs, we have the unintended consequence of excluding women, of excluding Indigenous people, of excluding people who self-identify as Black. It's not intentional. But it is important to recognize that when we're talking about digital skills, when we're talking about innovation, it is not synonymous with STEM, although STEM is clearly important. And, and this comes out really clearly in some of the research, again, that is going to be talked about in the, um, in the reports. And that is when we start to really define skills and really dig into how to measure skills. We find some interesting things. So there was a study that was that I think Brookfield did and was reported by the OECD, and it said digital skills, most important thing in Ontario, digital skills. And some people then hear computer science and engineering, we need more computer scientists and engineers. But look at the data. Only 10% of those people who said they need more digital skills were talking about programming. We're talking about Java developers. 15% we're talking about the use of advanced applications like SAP, SQL, and so on, which you do not need. You do not need a computer science degree for. Uh, technical support, quality assurance. Uh, there's Plato, uh, an organization out west that specifically takes indigenous people and trains them to do quality assurance and testing. In, in IT, you do not need a university degree in computer science for those jobs. It's really, really important to be precise about what it is that we need. And most importantly, 75% of the employers when they said they wanted digital skills, were talking about people who could use Microsoft Office and Excel. So we have to be very precise as we're going into this new environment where we know digitization is important, where we know digital skills are important, to be clear about what we need. And what we mean is not always those deep technical skills that we see with uh, computer science. A big, big, big gap and need is in people who understand enough about technology to match it to business requirements. Those are the people that can help with digital transformation. Similarly, entrepreneurial skills, people who can think outside of the box, who can develop new solutions, who can adapt and pivot. Um, those are critical skills, whether we're talking about supporting SMEs and startups, or we're talking about innovation in large organizations. The skills for teleworking, Managing remotely requires a whole different sensibility and a whole different set of skills. And we have to recognize that in this new environment, the way in which we assess performance, the way in which we support our, our employees, the way in which we deal with mental health and other kinds of stress, very, very different. And we can't forget about essential skills. We can't forget about English language training, and there are lots of really interesting innovative models that are workplace-based essential skills development that I think we can now really embrace in this new environment. So when we talk about the way forward, it's really important to think about developing a common language so we know what is meant when we're talking about digital skills so we can properly define it we can properly assess it, and therefore we can properly develop those skills, whether we're talking about embedding them in existing post-secondary and secondary education, whether we're talking about transitioning people into the workforce, or whether we're talking about upskilling and reskilling. Having that sectoral perspective, super important, and we really need to dig into different industries and, and what their specific needs are. Public administration is an, a huge opportunity 
because, frankly, of the aging boomers and the transformation of the public sector. It's often not a sector that we think about when we're looking at upskilling, reskilling, and, and opportunities. And we have to also continue, in my view, through policy and other instruments to ensure that employers seriously think about reskilling the existing workforce rather than pushing out the old in order to make space to bring in the new. It's not that we don't want opportunities for youth, but I think too many employers are willing to throw out institutional knowledge um, because of the absence of skills that actually can be taught. And we know Canadian employers don't invest enough in upskilling and reskilling. There are lots of innovative, interesting approaches, and I'm hoping Colin and uh, Colin will talk about some of those. And I think Stephen can talk about some of the transformation that big companies like Deloitte have undertaken. And, you know, this is just my pet peeve, but I think entrepreneurship is really part of what we need to embrace on multiple levels. We have to remember that COVID has exacerbated inequality. We have to remember that the impact on youth has been devastating and racialized youth have been affected more than others. These are already kids who, who face barriers in even getting their high school completed and COVID has made it worse. COVID has definitely made it worse, but it's also created opportunities for new approaches. And, and the study we just released with Environics was quite horrifying. In the city of Toronto, 42% of racialized families reported that they could not afford high-speed internet and their kids were doing their homework on their iPhones. And these are typically kids who face barriers uh, to begin with. So when we think about what's needed, we need, an, we need an ecosystem approach. We need to recognize that this is not just about fixing people and giving them skills. It's also about employers rethinking about how they evaluate people, taking an asset-based approach where they look at what people have and what can be added to it. And so, you know, from just the key takeaways for me from the entire series are these ideas that innovation is not just about technology. We really do have an opportunity to rebuild better that COVID has accelerated digitization, but the impacts are highly differentiated. We need to really challenge some of our assumptions about what skills are and what skills are needed. We need to maintain a user focused approach and really open ourselves up to alternative pathways and innovative approaches to, to fill gaps and also to make sure employers are not looking for skills in all the wrong places. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted now to uh, have a chance to hear more from our panel. So um, I will start off this part of the discussion by giving each of the panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves briefly and their perspectives on this sort of overarching question, which is, we know that pan the pandemic has, has wreaked havoc on almost every aspect of our lives, but it's also created opportunities for innovation. And, and how can we seize this opportunity to, to rebuild better? And I'll start, I guess, with, with you, Murtaza, because um, you've done a lot of thinking, not just about specifics, but the broader impacts of, uh, of uh, this transformation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Wendy. Thank you for the introduction on the, um, on the bigger challenge on skills and how, what pandemic means. I think um, one of the things that uh, resonates with me is when I started seeing the labor force report coming out of Statistics Canada uh, during pandemic and in the earlier months in May and June for the first time, they started to break down unemployment rate by um, different demographics or cohorts. And it turned out that visible minorities had a significantly larger unemployment rate as a result of the pandemic, and twice as much as the 
and non-visible minority population. So you're absolutely right that there is a big shift in the way the pandemic has affected people. Not all cohorts have been enabled or disabled at the same rate. So there's a diversity of the impacts of the pandemic. And so when you look at the opportunities, the opportunities are also diverse. I think one of the things that the at Ryerson University where I teach um, is uh, we have been looking at the spatial uh, or urban economic impacts of, of, of the pandemic. What our initial focus has been for the, since the last 12 months on real estate, but also looking at downtown and what it means. The future of work, especially for the white collar and knowledge economy workers has been tied in large cities, primarily to downtowns like downtown Toronto has about 480,000 employees, not all of them white collar knowledge economy workers, but that's the biggest concentration of, um, uh, of employees anywhere in Canada, or maybe the second or the third largest in, in North America. So now that you see that the buildings are there, the office towers are there, the work is continuing, but not in those office towers. The, um, the occupancy, physical occupancy is at a fraction of what it was at the pre-pandemic levels. So the work has continued, but in a different way. So the, what does it mean for the future? What does it mean once we have um, um, a successful rollout of the, of the vaccine and there's a herd immunity that develops, will people return to work with the same, at the same levels? Right now, if you look at the public transit uh, riderships, they are at a fraction of what they were before pandemic. Now, for the success of work and success of work locations such as downtown um, across Canada, that may, may that be Montreal, um, uh, Toronto, Vancouver, Ottawa, Calgary. Um, if people do not return to public transit riderships the same way they did before, then we will have a tough time bringing people to downtowns in the, in the morning rush hours. So new innovations have enabled the future of work to sort of uh, get a separation from geography. So there's a new spatial equilibrium that we see building up where people lived and where people worked, where they shopped and how they commuted. This has all changed. I think um, the biggest question that we are facing right now is how much of this current trend will continue into the future. Now I'm reminded of a paper that you wrote, Wendy, uh, some, I think, in late 80s. Before you were born. <laughs> so there was a paper that you wrote on the impact of television. 1977 or 8. Yeah. I, so yeah. I had to go through the Ministry of Transportation's archives, but I found that paper. So when we were writing a report on teleworking, and there were predictions um, uh, made in, in the, probably is one of the first papers in Canada written on teleworking. And so we, we, we looked at it. You have to realize that scale of transformation in, in the world of work that has happened. Um, so from 1980s, when telework became a word, a phrase, a noun, a concept, to all the way to 2020, March 2020, um, the, the increase uh, from zero was only to 12%. Only 12% of the Canadian labor force had, was working from home or remotely um, up until uh, March 2020. And then in a matter of few weeks, as the pandemic hit and the lockdowns came into effect, that number jumped to 33, 35, 36%. And that number is even more pronounced for people who have university degrees, who have masters and PhDs, and also for industries such as uh, um, uh, finance, insurance, management. So um, at one point when Statistics Canada surveyed, they found out that they, these, these finance, insurance, or culture, or arts companies, um, they had uh, more than 80% of those companies in April reported that half or more than half of their workforce was working from home. That was a jump from say 10 to 20%. But on the flip side, if you look at hospitality, if you look at the restaurants, uh, merely 10, 15% of the, uh, of the companies reported that half or more than half of their workforce was working remotely. All it tells us that it is a very uneven landscape. All it tells us is that the equilibria that has been disrupted is going to take some time to find the new common grounds, the new place where it's going to rest. And this disruption that we see um, is creating some uncertainty. But the way I see it, and, and I pardon my engineering background, every element of uncertainty, every period of uncertainty uh, makes engineers and scientists think more and look for opportunities to be better. The last comment I would make is uh, to share um, a, a presentation that the former Bank of Canada Governor, uh, Governor Carney did, um, in which he was explaining how um, through innovation, through different industrial revolutions, every time there was a fear that digital, that mecha mechanizations would lead to massive unemployment and so on and so forth. So he traced the 
um, the level of unemployment or employment gains throughout the history through various industrial revolutions all the way to this digitization phase, probably starting in 1980s. And he was able to show that with every successive innovative cycle, opportunities create more jobs than fewer jobs. And that's the hope that I want to uh, go forward with, that even with digitization and even with automation, I don't see a future of fewer jobs. I see a future of different jobs. And the goal for us um, and for the public sector is to prepare the future generation of workers, train Canadians to be able to be a successful, productive part of the future economy. And you know, Murtaza, the work that you do is so relevant to this and especially um, your, your ability to see the interconnections between different sectors, because as you said, the transformation in, in how we're working and how we're commuting or not and so on has ripple effects in terms of the different sectors and, and job tra trajectories. And I know um, Stephen Harrington from Deloitte, you've thought a lot about these issues as well. Do you want to just give a brief sort of overview of, of the work you're doing and, and your perspective on this? broader issue of, of uh, disruption and innovation. Yeah, uh, thanks, Wendy. So uh, for folks who don't know, I lead Future of Work Advisory for, for Deloitte here in Canada, and actually have recently taken on a role leading Human Capital Advisory for our federal government account team. So I have a funny position on this, but as Wendy knows, I've been studying this, this topic since 2011, the Future of Work topic, that is, and then COVID came along. Um, I, I'm actually going to take a short walk to, to bring it back to skills and, and say I, I do like to look at COVID in the context of the broader fourth industrial revolution, because that was happening first. It's just that COVID came along and busted the doors open, uh, right? And, and, and one thing I want to talk about is automation. Um, and, and one of the things we've been thinking a lot about recently is automation comes in different types. And I'm going to be really simplified about it, but let's think about substitution. Um, think about grocery stores that are starting to build these incredible warehouses that allow them to distribute groceries to your home more quickly. And in, in a lot of those warehouses, a lot like we saw with Amazon, a lot of the workers are being substituted. They're being completely replaced by robots who can do their work within those warehouses. Uh, you know, in just if you think about it from the employer's perspective, it's a it's a very strong play, but in that particular case, but how long will it last? How long will it be before all of the competitors of those grocery retailers will have exactly the same warehouses? So instead of substitution play, it advances the industry, it advances value for us as customers, but it is not a sustainable advantage. And what's, what's also difficult about substitution is you look at the same industry and you look at the grocery store self-checkout and you say, hmm, I'm not sure that one worked as well as you guys intended. Uh, you know, you go into any grocery store, you'll see somebody stationed to watch the self-checkout. By the way, there's somebody upstairs watching the video. And there are more people doing checkout than ever before. So I'm not sure that innovation landed. So you can see substitution's a bit of a risky play. And, and this is where I want to get to. What we think the greater opportunity is, is to think about how we can build technology that enables or even collaborates with humans so that you end up with this human machine interplay and you end up with work of the future being not more robotic, but actually more human. And the reason I took you on that short walk is because I think one of the things that, that, that we need to do really intentionally is begin to think about the work and how it could change. Imagine putting it up on a job canvas and asking yourself, how could we take out the dull and expensive tasks? How could we redesign the work so it's closer to customers and citizens? And then work backwards to think, what are the technology changes we need to make that work of the future true? It's a flip, it's a mindset shift. And I think that's the point when we need to ask ourselves, what skills do we need? Because what we'll have done is actually properly define the roles of the future. And Wendy, this goes back to something you were saying. I agree with you. We've agreed violently on this before. Employers often don't know what skills they want. And this is one of the reasons. They're not sure what the jobs of the future are, so they can't articulate it. I hope that, I hope that makes sense. Oh, you're on mute, Wendy. 
for me, that takes uh, makes tons of sense. And, you know, it's interesting because with both um, you, Stephen and Murtaza, we've talked about the idea of having to do more scenario planning just because of the uncertainty about the future and really thinking through what things could look like if this, then that. So I'll, tr I'll, I'll, um, I'll shift uh, to you, uh, to you, Marlene, and maybe you can give us your perspective, at both from Microsoft as a as an employer, but also Microsoft as a key driver of technological innovation. Thanks, Wendy, and thanks for having me. Um, look, the seismic shift that has happened over the last year on digital technology has been tremendous. Uh, the Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, says himself that in the first two months of the pandemic that we saw over two years worth of digital transformation during that period. And what does that mean? That means that probably companies are now thinking of things from technology and technology adoption that they were looking at for 2030 now happening in 2023, 2024, 25. And so this acceleration of that uh, digital transformation really presents challenges and new possibilities. Um, it's really shined a light on the widening skills gaps around the world, not just in Canada, and the greater urgency to accelerate that for economic recovery. And I think when you hit on some really interesting points of, we like to refer to it that, you know, we think that every job is going to be digital to some degree. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a developer or that you're out there coding, but that you need to have some level of digital skill, be it a frontline worker or an office worker like myself, that you're tech enabled regardless of the industry that you're in. And that every job out there is going to require some level of digital skills. Um, and that employers are gonna be looking for them. And there is a responsibility of employers to your point of retraining the people that's in their own um, in, uh, workforce. And you know these challenges are gonna require partnership across. Like employers can't do this on their own. Private industry, tech companies can't do it, non-for-profit governments, but we all need to collaborate. And I think this acceleration has really helped that, um, this digital transformation and this forced acceleration. Um, employers have to, so it, in the 1980s, there was a significant amount of training that employers did with the, with the personal computer and, and desktop computing. And so employers were getting um, their employees trained up on a regular basis. And around, um, around the early 2000s, that, that started to decline in those investments. And really, we stopped upskilling our own skills. Um, so we need to have that greater investment as an employer in our own in our own workforce because in a lot of cases you have employees that understand their work environment the work but what they need is that extra 10 percent 15 percent which gives them those digital skills in order to adopt and adapt to the new reality so we talked about um, automation that steven said we're not talking about automation of a full job we're talking about automation of a certain aspect of a job, which then leaves um, the employee with the opportunity to develop new skills that they can then use in their employment. And I think that that's where employers are really starting to see opportunity is about how do we find that skilling and how can we skill our own employees in digital skills, but also soft skills, because that is a very important part of this. Um, and you know, we, we look at this and I think before we even get started into digital skills per se, um, we need to really talk about the elephant in the room, which is we cannot talk about skills in digital skills unless we talk about affordable and equitable internet access for everyone. This is critical and a fundamental right. And the fact is that you can't have broad based economic recovery if a large segment of the population does not have basic internet access. Full stop. <laughs> I live within, I live in the suburbs of, of Gatineau in a little town called Elmer. And in about 
10 minutes, school's going to let out and my entire, um, my bandwidth is going to come to a halt because every kid is going to be on Netflix and gaming. And so I'm going to, I'm going to like say this really fast because they're going to start to get choppy. If I'm feeling that within a city of a million people, just imagine what that's like in rural, remote and Northern communities where they can't control of the economy, this digital economy, because they don't have the basic infrastructure. We're talking, this is like electricity of the 21st century. This is how basic it has become. And without that, you know, it's a little bit of a chicken of the egg. Access to broadband unlocks digital skills and digital skills unlocks the potential offered by broadband. So it's, you need to come with both of them. Um, and Wendy, just to reiterate what you said earlier in your, in your presentation, we're not talking about hardcore digital skills. We're talking about basic understanding of how digital works. Um, I have upskilled over the past year. Before, for a year ago, I probably wouldn't have been able, I have my two screens set up. I have multiple uh, applications up. That's a skill for me. Sometimes that's all we need. And when we're talking about um, skilling, what I have learned since joining Microsoft and where I've taken my soft skills and applied them to my job are things like, how do we use ethical use of AI in technology? And that here I am someone who has more of a social science background and, and, and more in that, that area. And how do I apply that to my work every day? Because one thing that Microsoft realizes as well, and I think any um, progressive uh, organization will realize is that diversity of thought within your ecosystem and within your workforce is when you're successful. If you have a homogenous group of people who feel all the same thing, that have all the same skills, life is gonna be pretty boring and there's not gonna be much innovation. And so those type of things are really necessary to have that level. Now that means I'm not an AI expert, but I understand the aspects of it that can be applied to everyday life in automation. And so those are the types, when we talk about digital skills, that's also important. Um, that being said, we estimate that there's probably about 149 million new technology oriented jobs coming up in the global workforce. If we can get people the basic skills in order to take some of those jobs, just think of the economic impact that we would have. So that is uh, kind of the world according to Marlene and how I see the world. It's, uh, it's amazing if someone had told me before joining Microsoft that I'd be on a conversation talking about my new technology skills, I probably would have laughed. It was not, this was not a strength for me. But now that I can say that I've upskilled myself and I think sometimes we think of this in a very complicated way where it can be very, small incremental pieces that's provided to employers, which makes them strengthened, that makes their jobs better, and that they can uh, be, um, uh, that they can apply and be more productive in the workplace. And you know, it's so funny because I skipped over one of my slides in the interest of time, but if you look at the women who are CEOs of tech companies, the big tech companies in the, in the US, most of them did not graduate in engineering or computer science. And that's because, you know, coming back to that earlier point, if we're looking at technology adoption, if we're looking at driving innovation, it is absolutely critical to know what the technology can be used for, which is very different than, than having to build it. And it's like, I can't change my own oil, but I know how to drive my car. And I think that... Uh, we have, to, we have to keep thinking about these multiple pathways and opportunities because of the inclusion piece. And, you know, you talked about access to, to digital and I talked about the, you know, the digital poor who live in large urban centers where it isn't really physical access, it's affordability. But 50% of our Indigenous people live in rural and remote communities where we know many do not have access to running water and they certainly don't have internet access and that impacts everything along the, along the pipeline from you know, graduation from high school all the way through to uh, the kinds of jobs that can be done. So perfect segue to um, 
to talk about um, what Blueprint is doing and to uh, give Colin a chance to talk about some of the innovative approaches that, that he's familiar with. Because one of the big issues in all of this, in my mind, is what works and for whom. And, and we have to be prepared to drive innovation by trying new things, but also, frankly, giving up on the stuff that doesn't work. And we know um, half of our English language training for, for newcomers, for instance, does not teach them more English than they would learn driving Uber. Well, there's real opportunities, I think, to, to transform the way we think about assessing and developing and utilizing skills. So over to you, Colin. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so yeah, the work I do is actually thinking about programming and how the public sector is currently delivering programming to upskill individuals in that sector. Often people from different backgrounds that you wouldn't expect is Wendy has pointed out individuals that aren't trained in engineering or computer science. Um, and it's interesting to hear from the panelists that there, there basically are these like two things that are coming to a head. On one end, we have quite a bit of job displacement, whether it be through COVID or whether it be through digitization or automation of jobs. And on the other hand, we have a bunch of new skills that are needed in ecosystem. And to me, what's interesting is that there are a couple of like programs that are trying to meet those two things in the middle and try to find ways to actually train new people on these skills to give them new like pathways to employment. Um, so I want to take a second to highlight two programs that us at Blueprint are lucky enough to be evaluating. Um, both programs actually sponsored through FSD. Um, the first of those is Empower Canada. Um, Empower started by doing, and um, Marley knows they have a partnership with Microsoft right now. So uh, they're a really great program. They have done a lot of research over the years to identify a set of in-demand entry-level jobs in the IT sector and work directly with employers to curate curriculum that can train individuals in specific competencies needed to satisfy the demands of those jobs. And this is like a secret series of training programs for entry into these very specific jobs. But what they do is take individuals from marginalized backgrounds. Um, these are individuals that are racialized or new immigrants. Um, and also that have a history of either poor labor market attachment or who have struggled with post-secondary education. So almost all of their partner, um, participants only have high school education. Um, but what's cool is they take a, like, a very strength-based approach. They say that these individuals, um, they're not, they are smart, they are intelligent, they may not know how to learn in the way that many of us have learned through colleges and universities, but that doesn't stop them from learning really hard, really specific, competencies in the digital sectors. Like they learn how to set up cybersecurity for companies. I can't do that. Um, and what they have targeted is that what is needed is just high support for these individuals. Or universities tend to be like high demand, but low support and or employment training infrastructure often is low demand and high support. And Empire said, let's do better by these people. Um, and so they equip them with the soft skills they need to not only succeed in this training, but also with employers. And then they work directly with people like Marlene and the folks at Microsoft to set up jobs and give warm handoffs to these individuals who otherwise have really struggled to actually find pathways and are from backgrounds that aren't well represented in the, in, in the IT sector, whether it be individuals that are black or identify as indigenous, um, these individuals are coming through this training program and working really well for employers. Also, as you pointed out, Wendy, Empire is really good about like knowing what their data is. They know what who they serve really well. Um, they know what their placement rates are. They know which of these programs are working because they talk to employers, they talk to their participants, and they collect data. Um, and the second program I wanted to highlight, which Wendy is pretty familiar with, um, it's out of the Diversity Institute. It's called ADAPT. Um, ADAPT, as Wendy has been pointed out, has kind of identified that there's a set segment of recent college graduates, um, often from non-technical backgrounds, that don't have an immediate lined up sort of vocational path. Um, there's not an automatic path to employment. So they have great critical thinking skills. They've learned a lot of the things that are emphasized in university, but there isn't a next step. 
in addition, as we've been talking about, there's a bunch of these digital skills. And we're not talking about those kind of empire skills that people are training, but as Wendy has pointed out, it's how do you make a pivot table in Excel? Do you know what search engine optimization is? Do you have the things that when you step on your first day into an employer, they can give you a task and you can succeed at it? And so what ADAPT does is they've actually curated a set of modules on these specific digital skills targeted at recent college graduates from non-STEM backgrounds. Um, and on top of that, what I like is that ADAPT works with these participants not only on those hard technical skills, but also on how do you brand yourself to employers? How do you do a proper resume preparation? How do you network? The types of stuff that I know I didn't learn in university, I didn't learn in grad school, I didn't learn in my PhD, probably don't know that well, but it's really needed to like enter the, the labor market. Um, and the thing that I like with ADAPT is those modules change year to year, cohort to cohort. It's based on data from surveys from participants every time going out to employers and saying, okay, are you still using Google Analytics? Are you still using R? Is Python the new language? Okay, cool. We're going to change to make sure we can actually train people in those specific things that are in demand in the, in the sector. And so both of those programs highlight three kind of pillars that I think are super important for training programs, not only in digital skills training, but in general. Um, and those are making sure that you meet a need on the demand side of the labor market, working directly with employers to understand what that need is, how you can create curriculum to actually satisfy it, and also to like set participants up to succeed with those employers. Secondly, there's a whole segment of people that are ill-suited or ill-served by traditional learning and educational approaches. And we need better ways and more innovative ways to approach training these individuals. Because it's not that they're not smart. It's not that they don't want to work. It's not that they don't want to try hard. They just need different sauce that doesn't work for, you know, you and I or people that like me and Wendy that have gone through PhD programs. It's just a different thing. And lastly, data, data, data. Um, I'm not talking about trying to model the labor market 10 years from now, um, but literally just trying to figure out what an employer will need in three months. And when your per participants get out of that program, they haven't learned just a bunch of nonsense that won't get them anywhere. How do you actually talk to employers, talk to participants and learn from best practices so that these programs can actually work and set people up for success? Thanks so much, Colin. And maybe you didn't know I'm on the board of Empower. So it is also one of my most favorite. But I think, um, you know, the point you make is so important. We really have to stop training people for imaginary jobs. And I think it's, it's you know, employers have to stop looking for skills in the wrong places. And we have to stop training people for imaginary jobs. And that employer-centered approach, I think does make, make all the difference with Empower and with, with uh, ADAPT and with a lot of the most successful programs, there is that work integrated learning approach as well that says we need to get people in the door because often like over 80% of the Empower kids get in the door for their internship and the employers see their value and keep them. Same thing with ADAPT. And I think that you know, there's lots of really good opportunities for, for creating those alternative pathways. I'll come to you, Murtaz, in a sec, but I just wanted to, to go to Stephen because I know for sure that uh, Deloitte has done a lot of work internally in terms of upskilling and reskilling um, and investing in, in your, your own employees to kind of bring them on board. And you're also looking at what um, the federal government's going to be doing as part of its digital transformation. So can you comment a bit on that? And then I'll, I'll go back on script. You're on mute too. <laughs> and I was double muted. Um, <laughs> So, so absolutely. I mean, we, we've, we've taken that sort of learning journey seriously for a long time when there's a Deloitte University in most of our major markets. But, you know, I'm going to be frank with you, what we're recognizing through COVID is that's not enough. And I really love the comments about work integrated learning in particular. And this is where we plan on pushing next. I, I'm always fascinated by the great lies we tell ourselves in our markets. And, and one of those has always been that you go to university or to college and you get an education, you're fully credentialized and you go directly into a role in what you learned. No, you don't. We know that's not true. We know that 
for most people, they go through that education, they try to apply it to an employer and the employer says, where's your experience? So in other words, we've known for a long time that work experience is more valuable at the point of labor market attachment in some ways than the education. And, and the answer is obvious. We just have to look for more ways to break education into bite-sized pieces, just enough, just enough to do that first activity in work. And after you do that activity in work, go back to education. And, and I'm, I'm admitting that because I think uh, as an employer, we have a ways to go even from that perspective as well. We're doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. So we are beginning to look at creative options. How could we set up learning academies for people who maybe didn't finish those educational steps? But we can do, you know, find out if they have high drive, high conceptual thinking, put them into courses, quick hit directly into apprenticeship type roles. Because frankly, in a town like Ottawa and the federal government, there is far more demand for digital skills, particularly the ones you were talking about, Wendy, those specific uh, you know, SAP, Oracle integration jobs, for an example, than we have anywhere near the market for in Canada, never mind in Ottawa. So that's talk about an opportunity for growth, right? And when you look at, at low code, no code kinds of systems development stuff, when you look at data analytics and so on, massive opportunities, and you can take people through alternative pathways to get there. Just, just coming back to you, Murtaza, and of course, you know, I think we need more engineers, but um, as part of, your, uh, as part of your, uh, your report, you did talk about some of the, the new skills that may be needed in order to manage in these new environments. I wonder if you wanted to, to just build on that a little bit. Yes, so um, our colleague at the University of Montreal, uh, Tanya Saba, Professor Tanya Saba was uh, the one who led the initiative. She, uh, they had run several, um, they, they had run a large uh, surveys to find out what, what's going on. And I think if I were to summarize a few things, there's the element of um, given working from home and teleworking, um, self-discipline um, and self-motivation. So that's a task um, or skill that uh, is not related to tech, but then now that you're working from home and or in a, an environment where you are working from a satellite office and that former manager supervision uh, round the clock over the shoulder is not there, how do you still be productive and be able to manage your time? So that's a skill that's needed. At the same time, um, there's the, the conversation about uh, rising levels of stress because of this disconnect with the rest, the ecosystem, the, the office ecosystem has been disrupted. So people have been working on their own for long. So how do you cope with um, uh, the, the stress levels? How do you prevent stress from becoming stressful um, is another skill and people would not maybe know of by themselves. There may be some interventions needed to help people manage um, discipline and manage the levels of stress. The other thing is that uh, when I was researching on, on data science and analytics, um, we looked at what skills people really want and we were, I was able to find um, prefer so some co quotations from, uh, there was a, um, uh, DJ Patel was the chief data scientist for the White House under President Obama. So I got some, some references from him and I got the, one of the senior managers from uh, Google and what they were saying is that data matters because they're data-driven companies, data drives everything. But what really matters is storytelling, that someone is able to communicate. So I think in this whole notion of technology and programming and software languages and whatnot, the ability to communicate, the ability to be able to do something, finish it and communicate it to your peers or superiors is going to be a critical skill. And at the same time, while, you, while you're doing all of this, you there has to be a way that people realize that in this environment now, uh, we have gone back to school regardless of us being in a school, enrolled in a program or not. There's an element of learning that is happening for everyone. People have learned to work with cameras and Zoom microphones and whatnot. And this learning will, shouldn't stop. And I think from, from a product, productivity point of view, not just looking at the marginalized communities, now you look at the economy entirely and say, how do we leverage this opportunity? Because see, our, our biggest asset was also a big disadvantage. That is that we had a very, we were the second largest land mass with just 39 million people. So we had lots of land, that's a good thing, but then how do you serve communities throughout mm -hmm. it? I'm working with a colleague in journalism program where we are actually looking at CIRA data, 
the Canadian International, the Canadian Internet Agency. And we're looking at the upload and download speeds in, yeah. in all across Canada. And it's a very difficult thing. The technological revolution or the, the ability to implement technological solutions relies on our ability to provide uh, pro pro provide uh, internet the same way we provide water. Yeah, no, it's it's um, that that the digital divide issue is is an ongoing thing, and it's funny, it's funny. I don't know if you were thinking about it, but Murtaza actually helped my daughter, who had graduated with a master's degree in fine arts, spending her inheritance before I'm dead, at Parsons University in New York City. I made her take a digital analytics course. She cried every night. Murtaza helped her. She now works at BCG and will be supporting me in my retirement. So, so you know, I, I think we've all got those examples of people benefiting from access to these alternative pathways. Wendy, can I say a word about adaptive no, Just, uh, sorry. It, yeah, okay, sure. Very briefly. So uh, with ADAPT, we were training this people we, who had done degrees in non-tech or STEM disciplines. And I was one of the people of several people who were teaching it. Last year, um, we, we delivered ADAPT online. We actually transformed the entire curriculum in, of, that was over a full day or two day or three day period into chunks of bite size internet-based training in data science and R and Python. And, and it's, it's a success in the way that we have been able to reach not just people here because I only taught in yeah. Toronto. This year, last year with internet, we taught in Calgary and other places. So I think there's an enabling factor that we should focus on that we can go farther to communities that we'd never served before or couldn't serve before. Yeah, the curation of programs, I think is a great opportunity. But I was gonna just say, Marlene, in terms of your clients or Microsoft's clients generally, what are you seeing with respect to the skills issues? Well, it's it really runs the the gamut of depending on what you're what you're looking at, right? Like when from Microsoft customers are across the board. So when you have large enterprise customers, they often are uh, working extensively to up, upskill their own technology plus their plus their employers or their employees. Uh, when you're dealing with SMEs, that's where the challenge is, and as we know. Um, from the experience that we've had that SMEs have been walloped by the pandemic and, you know, getting them to digitally transform during this time of chaos, one might argue that some have done particularly well, they've been able to pivot, but then they need as well to ensure that their employees are trained up and that they can, they can innovate on those platforms and that they're doing those type of things. Look, we can all be doing more in, in this regard in terms of upskilling and training. Um, I think the government does have, I think there's a public policy piece to this, um, you know, I'll reiterate internet, very important. But the second piece is some sort of tax incentive for employers, um, especially small businesses, um, in order to help stimulate um, not just digital, not just buying of technology, but actually the skilling um, and making sure that that's happening. Um, I'm really glad that Colin brought up Empower Canada as I think it is a really unique and wonderful program. Um, we happy to support it. We brought along and we worked with the digital super cluster in Vancouver in order to try to get some scale and scope to the work that it's doing because it is connecting with the employers. So she, I loved your quote, Andy, uh, Wendy is saying like, we have to stop training people for jobs that don't exist, right? So we went out, it's, it's really about saying, what are the skills you need and how can we upskill these people very quickly? Um, governments have a place to play in this as well, right? So is there some sort of, you know, April 19th is the next budget. So I will put my plug in some sort of tax incentive for uh, small businesses, even for medium and large size businesses, but really for small businesses in terms of making sure that their employees have what they need in terms of skills. And you know, it's funny because uh, ESDC is one of our biggest funders. I have to say though, that in general, the skills agenda has been driven by large corporations. If you look at, at who, is, who is setting the agenda to a large extent, it's large corporations and they account for about, what is it, 10, 15% of private sector companies. SMEs, and I was just on a call this morning with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, SMEs are for the most part, 
not even at the table when these things are discussed in terms of what they need and the support. And, you know, with work integrated learning programs, for example, it's wonderful what's been done to support co-op students, but I would argue that there's a lot that could be done to better meet the needs of SMEs and transition um, workers into the workplace and provide more opportunities for newcomers and so on. So I agree with you. I think there is a, there's, everybody has to play a role. You know, the providers have to innovate, stop training people for imaginary jobs. Employers have to step up and be clear about what's needed and collaborate. But there's also opportunities for policy innovation. I'm going to, we have to turn it over back to, to Julie. So I just wanted to give you um, the last word on this segment, Colin, if there was anything you wanted to add in terms of your observations broadly about where the opportunities are to kind of harness innovation and move this all forward. So I'd say there are two pieces. Uh, touching on a point that Stephen brought up, uh, there is a, a model in the States called Career Pathways that tends to target lower skilled jobs um, where the whole concept is you take a course, you go do one level of a job, you come back to the workplace and do another level like of training and you get a higher degree. Um, I think not enough companies have taken that approach to more higher level jobs, whether it be consulting over at Deloitte or uh, being you know, a professor or that kind of stuff. Like we need better approaches at that, that re recognize that what we need now is people that continue to learn on the job and continue to learn throughout it. Like it is gone the time of uh, the boomer that sits in, a, in, in an office for 30 years and can rest on their laurels from a bachelor's degree. Um, I've, I'm, you know, I'm barely over 30 and I've had to reinvent myself three times at this point. Um, every single generation after me is gonna have to do that over and over again. And employers need to support that and understand it. Um, and I think that will, come as Marlene pointed out from government actually having these available training that are low cost and low barrier, but also rethinking the way we think about how people occupy jobs. Um, we shouldn't be putting individuals in 60 and 80 hour jobs because they're trying to fill two roles. We need to better understand what the skills are for individual portions of these jobs and meet those requirements rather than, you know, trying to pile things up top on top of individuals and give them the right skills. Because people fail in jobs because they're just asked to do things that they're not trained to do and that companies don't provide them the right skill training. And it's not their fault. Yeah, I think, um, I, I, I think you raised a really important point that we're talking about in terms of micro-credentials and stackable micro-credentials and figuring out how to put things together in new combinations. Really, it's all about innovation. I will stop talking and hand it over to Julie now in the audience's questions. Excellent. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. There's tons of questions coming in, which I think is a tribute to uh, the interest and the knowledge on this panel. So thanks so much for all of your insights. Um, the first question talks about, the panelists mentioned the divide between geography and work, for example, working from home, along with different impacts on different groups, educated knowledge workers, et cetera. What will this mean for how workplaces may need to support workers' mental health in the future? And I'm gonna leave it a bit open if someone wants to jump in on that one. Yeah, I'm happy to, to, to kick off. Uh, this, is, this is a massive challenge. Um, the data that we're looking at shows that those same folks that are taking advantage of the opportunity to work from home are tending to work upwards of two to three extra hours per day. Um, we've always known this about telework. Wendy, I studied the same papers that you wrote in the 70s about telework. And we, we, this is one of the arguments to employers from the beginning is, hey, look, people work harder. But you know, one of the challenges is that that is now growing without constraint. And I think this is one of those things we need people to go back to design thinking. You need to think fundamentally about what could the what could a professional's work look like if we redesigned it from scratch. And I bet Marlene Microsoft's thinking about it because you know one of the one of the challenges is some of the technologies that we use to organize work in the workplace, like an Outlook calendar, it really leaves us with the impression that our day is 20, 30 minute available slots and we should let strangers fill them with meetings. And, and so I, I, I just raised that example to say, we need to fund a, a fundamental rethink. 
wellness needs to be baked right into the concept of work itself, not a program off to the side. Um, I'll jump in there to, to Stephen just to, to put a fine point on that. Uh, my background is actually like my PhD was in, in mental health and addiction. And it, it's so important, right? Like it, all the stats say that people are getting worse off working from home. And that might be the impact of the, the pandemic as well. But I really think that having your, like people have gone to this, this route where now, now what's happening is that work and, and home life has become just overlapped. And we have society saying that there's this 40 hour, five days a week, six days a week, whatever it might be, that came from nothing, right? Like in the 40s or the 50s, someone just decided that a 40 hour, five day work week was the thing that we do. And no one has like thought about it differently. Um, and I think it's time for us to actually think intentionally about what is the best structure for people to actually be productive and support the employers without burnout, because all of us, both the employers and the employees, will benefit a lot more from that than just assuming that 40 by 5 is the right solution. Yeah, and Microsoft Japan actually has established a four-day workweek pilot, haven't they, Marlene? They, have, they haven't brought it to Canada yet. Uh, maybe I'll start implementing it on my own. You know, Friday's off. <laughs> we do have no meeting Fridays, which are great because you can actually get some work done. Um, but I, I think everyone does raise a really, you know, it's a good point. And I was on a conversation earlier today with Julie as part of their, um, the PPF accessibility um project you're working on. And, you know, one of the things that they brought up was we were talking about uh, people with disabilities and accommodation and coming back into the workforce and the remote work and how, you know, we anticipate that we've always estimated about a billion people in the world have a disability. And that number is going to skyrocket once you add in uh, mental health and the impact that COVID has had. And it was kind of this aha moment I had. I was like, oh, never thought about that, right? Of we're now gonna be having to have this, um, how do we as employers um, deal with that? How do we, um, I always like to refer to it as, it's not work-life balance because that would insinuate it's 50-50 and it's not, that it's work-life blending. And I found that that has, <laughs> the blending has worked for me because it, it makes it a little bit easier. But how do we, how do we as employers really be empathetic? And how do we make sure that we understand the, the, the challenges that people with disabilities, because that's, I think that it's a broader term, but I think we can talk about mental health as, as, as a disability as well. Um, and that how are we going to be empathetic in what they need um, coming forward in, you know, this pandemic has blown the doors over it, off it. And I'm glad we're having these conversations, but so much work needs to be done before we figure out how it, how it looks. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks to many of you. A question here from Stephanie Bernier for Colin. Uh, Colin, you mentioned creating interventions and different approaches for students who required varied approaches to learning. So how do you validate and measure the success of your programs post-learning and even into the workforce? Yeah, so that's actually something that's, uh, I think, underserved currently in our market and that we go out of a way to do. So um, there are two ways, right? There's traditional approaches, which is just making sure to follow up with participants. This has been done for years in employment in Ontario, terribly, but it's been done. And it's, it's a cornerstone of evaluation. What we do have access to now is that Statistics Canada is doing a really good job of creating longitudinal data sets of tax filing data um, across all participants in Canada that we should be using better. Like Canada actually is really good data infrastructure that is not being able to be used in the, in the same way that America is using that data. And so we can theoretically um, link participants in a completely anonymized data secured way to figure out if these programs actually cause increases in employment and retention in satisfaction at their jobs over the long term. Um, and I know ESBC is really interested and us at Bluefin are really interested. And I think we as a society, especially in Canada, need to make a push towards understanding longitudinally how people are doing. We, we have massive gaps in our longitudinal data um, because certain administrations often decide that, you know, long form censuses or whatever might not be the right way. But we got to make commitments to collecting the data and understanding programs from an administrative standpoint. 
Um, thank you, Colin. The next question is from Sean Dorson, who is the um, CEO at Skills Canada. Um, he's asking, how do you see the digital transformation impacting skills, uh, skilled trade occupations? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. What, this has been a big topic for us, not just in the trades, but there's been a, an interesting new divide that's occurred through COVID. Uh, we've done, because I'd have to have a tinfoil hat on to not do work around new ways of working or hybrid workforce or whatever you want to call it. Uh, all, every organization is trying to figure out how they're going to manage that. But the divide it creates is we look at the people who could work from home and are ignoring entirely the people who can't. And so a principle that we keep trying to apply is called something for everyone. And I'll give you an example that I keep using because it's my favorite. Um, in, the, in, the, in the government space, there are lots of people every day that do site inspections. And there is, it is a trade. It is a, you need to know, for an example, they might be building inspections. There's all kinds of apprenticeship programs to get people skilled up for this. The, the general, generally the way that person's life runs is they live often in a suburb and they commute to wherever their head, their head office or their, or their warehouse is. They pick up their truck and their orders for the day and off they go. So if you go back to that job canvas idea I was talking about earlier, what we're imagining is, well, first of all, could they have the truck in their own driveway so that they don't have to commute to get it? And then how can we use sensors in the buildings or the places that they need to go and visit so that actually they're driving data to their iPad that they carry with them so they, they can learn more about the, the sites that they're inspecting without actually going there. And how can they, we create opt-in programs so that employers are driving data into that same data set, even outside of sensors. So now the future of that job is still the trade, but it is now enabled and it is a collaborative partnership between that individual and the data that they need to do their job. That's just an example, I hope a pragmatic example of what I mean when I say we need to redesign jobs and, when, and now when I say something for everyone. Julie, if I may. Absolutely, uh, please. So during the first series of lockdowns, uh, Statistics Canada through the Labour Force Survey collected information about who's working from where. And in the April-May survey, when we had the most stringent lockdowns, the numbers were following. 40% uh, of the Canadian labor force was working from home. 20% was away from work for whatever reason. And another 40% had their work locations still outside of their home, which meant that even under the most uh, uh, telework conducive environment, that's a lockdown, you still have 40% of your labor force that had to go out and work in the, in the open. And these are the trades where you cannot uh, digitize construction. If you're a construction worker, um, you have to be on site. There's no amount of Python or R programming that would allow you to design a building that self-builds. If you are a plumber, you have to be on site. If you're an electrician, you have to go. And obviously technology can help um, get sensor information, but if there's something broken, you have to go and fix. So the, for the government to think about uh, what they have planned, um, it's not just STEM, the apprenticeship-based careers and those careers and jobs where you have to be on site to fix things, they have to keep account of them and they have to make sure that these careers continue to be supported and not ignored in our focus on digitization. Because 40% of Canadians will leave and have to work outside. That's a minimum. Thank you, Martaza. The next question is from Alec, Alex uh, Vukovic. Um, he asks about the barriers to digital transformation in Canada. What can federal policymakers do? And maybe I'd go to each of you on this question and um, relate it back to what Marlene was saying um, in terms of the upcoming federal budget. If there was something that could help to alleviate these, these barriers, what would, what would your wish list be? Perhaps one from each of you. I'll start with you, Marlene. <laughs> um, of course, um, the biggest one, internet, basic internet, um, that is the biggest public policy thing that we can do to support digital transformation, um, that it will transform rural and remote areas, 
and allow them to contribute. So um, hands down, first, number one, public policy. Uh, second, uh, we talked about it earlier, enhanced um, training incentives or tax incentives for employers in order to upskill or reskill their employees. I think that that could be a really in, um, big piece. And I would say that um, from our experience, uh, one of the biggest stumblers to digital transformation is that it's seen as hard, right? And it's that it's hard and it's complicated and it's technology. And I think our senior leaders in companies that perhaps aren't necessarily tech companies, but I would argue every company is a tech company now of some degree, if you want to be successful in this new economy, um, those senior executives in that C-suite have to get their heads around how they deal with digital transformation. This is not just the tech the IT group anymore that's that's ensuring that we're, we're digitally adopting. It has to be from stem to stern in every business. And there is a fear of, you know, we've always done it this way. Why should we try something different? Why should we try something new? But that's where that productivity piece does come from. So. Okay, Stephen, what would you add? I want to double down on internet because maybe if we repeat it, it'll happen. Uh, although it is interesting, if you have been watching Elon Musk and Starlink, there is a private sector solution that's beginning to make a difference. And I'm interested to see how government might take advantage of that opportunity. Because while it is excellent, it's also very individually expensive. Uh, you know, it, and here's a policy idea that might be bad, but hey, we're, we're amongst friends. So let's talk about, you know, in the US in the last election cycle, it was fascinating to see somebody stand up and run for president and say, we need to tax robots. But again, I'll go back to some, and I, I think by the way, that alone might not be a good idea. Uh, taxing innovation might slow things down, but what if we could figure out a way to incent or tax either way that divide between substitution plays I talked about earlier and technology that changes jobs? Because another way of thinking about the digital uh, transformation concept is really at the individual level. That's what it is. We want more and more places where technology is changing jobs. And if we can incent employers to do that faster, then we end up with more human work and we end up with more jobs. Um, so anyway, I hope that makes sense. And I'm not sure how you put that into a policy paper or if it's even a good idea, but there you go. Thank you, Stephen. Murtaza? Um, Two things, um, if you want the workers to return to office, especially to um, uh, large employment hubs in downtowns, then rescue your public transit because without public transit, you will not be able to populate those buildings. Um, in downtown Toronto, 70% of the workers who work there um, and arrive in the morning rush hour, 70% of them arrive for public transit. So public transit would be the linchpin to revive uh, office towers. And if you are not doing that, and if teleworking becomes the norm, then I think you have to invest in daycare because it is adversely impacting the quality of life for women who have children, younger children. So you have the internet, you have the job and you have family to take care of. And all of this is now um, happening simultaneously in a 700 square foot apartment. So without, um, and I know that Quebec has a reasonable daycare program, but the rest of Canada doesn't. If you think that working from home and teleworking has to take root, and has to be a reasonable, reliable, affordable daycare program. So people who have technology and willing to work can also do work without interventions and without having to do, be a parent and a worker at the same time. I'm just gonna, as a, as a working mother, here, here, thank you. <laughs> thank you for saying that. And I will get off my soapbox. Julie has heard me uh, talk about this, but it's absolutely hands down. And it's even better when a man says it, I hate to say it, but it's more powerful in some weird sort of way that we don't want to admit. Uh, Colin, what about you? Um, I think Think Bigger is my um, answer to it. We have the opportunity as we transform digitally to transform a lot of other ways that we think about things. And every panelist here has discussed these, you know, innovative ideas or policy changes that can really fundamentally shape the way that work looks like in Canada, whether it be including more individuals from diverse backgrounds and professions that they didn't have access to, whether it be rethinking the way that our cities are set up in order to uh, uh, account for not only people that are teleworking, but people that are not, and to even the rethinking what a job means in terms of hours, commitment, 
um, what an employer actually owes to its employee instead of thinking about it the other way. I think that there's real opportunity that when we have systematic shifts, um, too many people are afraid of just that systematic shift and don't realize that it opens up the opportunity to do so much more. And this is the time. And I hope that our policymakers and the people around this table will help push that in the right direction. Collins just inspired me to, to add, like it, just from a mindset perspective, it would be lovely to see a government begin to shift from talking about COVID as the only issue in front of us and begin to say, hey, for a country our size, wouldn't it be great to have a future economy where people could work wherever they choose to and find real positive labor market attachment? <laughs> nice puppy, Riley. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. Sorry. <laughs> Um, we're going to wrap things up. We've only got two minutes left or three minutes left for Pedro Barada, who's the executive director of the Future Skills Center and a fabulous partner of PPF and the Diversity Institute. Pedro, over to you. Uh, thank you, Julie. That was fabulous. And we ended up on a policy note. So well done in terms of your cu curation. Uh, great conversation. Thank you very much to our panelists, Stephen Mortaza, Marlene, and Colin and our intrepid moderator, Frank Setter, and future thinker since at least 1976, according to the record, Dr. Wendy Suke, well done. One thing we heard loud and clear today is that skills alone is not enough as the only solution for the recovery and to prepare Canadians for a fast changing future. Uh, Melanie and others talked about access to broadband as new basic plumbing. Martaza talked about anticipating stress and making it less stressful and the need for mental health in this blended model. I wanna double down on the childcare conversation because not only is it important in terms of gender equity and making sure that parents are sane, but it's actually one of the best levelers, right? In terms of early childhood education and making sure that we're creating a really good workforce starting early. So uh, great to hear that. Uh, and of course, Colin talked about how skills are great, but systemic barriers based on your background and what you look like are also really key in terms of us building shared prosperity. But we also heard that skills are crucial, one absolutely necessary piece for how we move forward. And it's interesting that the panelists kept going back to uh, an, a, a notion of skills, but at the same time, uncertainty about what lies in the future. And that's certainly something that most surveys these days are showing in terms of employers. Uh, the latest KPI and GHR survey showed that most employers say reskilling and upskilling is absolutely essential in terms of our business model and our success. The majority of them say that. A minority actually report that they know exactly what they want to do or that they will invest because of a whole variety of reasons. And so conversations like today's are absolutely essential because they begin to unlock and sense make uh, how is it that we can move forward. So. Um, uh, uh, Wendy uh, and everybody talked about how digital is really key, but you know, social emotional skills and cognitive skills are actually going to be as important, if not more important, as jobs change. Um, uh, I, I, Stephen, I loved your point around technology uh, in the long term, uh, really being looked at uh, not as a short term money maker, but really as an incentivizer to enable human skills and how this will be key. Uh, in terms of, of long-term success. The importance of valuing diversity of background and skills and models like Empower, uh, which we are, we're making a multi-million dollar investment in Empower to scale it to two new provinces and really create the evidence base that hopefully uh, will make uh, programs like Empower the rule rather than the exception, right? For how we do policy and how we invest in programs. Uh, and of course, uh, the whole message around collaboration. Um, I really hope uh, that one of the takeaways is that um, the best way to move forward is not to operate in silos. That if we are going to have policy solutions that are about incentivizing employers to invest more in skills building, hopefully that will also incentivize collaboration with the existing ecosystem of universities, colleges, community-based providers that are existing investments ready to be leveraged and ready to be activated to co-create solutions about what employers need, and how is it that we create much more responsive programs on the ground? So hopefully that becomes part of the policy discussion. I will simply end up by uh, thanking all the panelists and also a big shout out to Diversity Institute and, uh, and of course the Public Policy Forum for taking the lead on the skills in the post-pandemic world series. There's eight papers. Today we released uh, a few of them, but there will be more. And, uh, and hopefully these will really trigger uh, conversations about the recovery, the role of skills, 
and uh, and how important it is it's going to be for sh for shared prosperity. So um, please, uh, for for all of you who are part of the conversation today, stay uh, stay close to us. Uh, follow us, of course, on on social media. Uh, check out our websites, and also um, I invite you to join our uh, Future Skill Center's new community of practice, powered by Magnet. Uh, where we can continue these conversations in real time and where you can also follow a lot of the work that's coming out, including the diversity institutes and public policy forums, fantastic uh, collaboration. Uh, this session was recorded, so you can come back to it over and over and over again, as well as all of our next content. Uh, let me just end by thanking all of you for making this uh, your choice for how to spend a Wednesday afternoon. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all again. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.